Hey, hey, welcome to Meeple Syrup. It is episode 124. That's a whole lot of episodes, Jess. That's a, that's a bunch. That is a lot of episodes. Um, and I think we even have a name for this episode. I'm just not sure what it is, but I'll, I'll find it. But before that, uh, Jesse, can you go right ahead and introduce our guest for the evening? Yeah, absolutely. So here in the lovely red banner is Nate Murray, uh, great beard. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Nate, Nate's done a lot of things in the board game industry. He's, uh, I mean, I know him from his uh, time as the chief captain of IDW's games division. Um, I believe he's back with them now, but I'm not sure in what capacity, but we're really happy to have him on board and talk about all sorts of cool uh, publisher side and designer side stuff. And then here in the blue, we have Travis Chance uh, from the newly minted Colossal Games, uh, which currently has uh, Western Legends up on Kickstarter right now. And hopefully give Travis a chance to tell everybody about that in a second. I've got some questions. Um, so but Travis is also uh, formerly of Action Phase Games and Indie Board and Card. He's been in the industry for a while, and he's got uh, a lot of insight on the publisher side of things and the design of th side of things. I've actually co-designed a couple of things with him um in the last year or two so excellent how come you don't design games nate marie well you have you've designed some games. i i have uh i you know i prefer development to design personally um okay. i like coming into a project 85 to 90 percent done um and that's where i found over the last few years that i'm really good at that uh but getting a thing from zero to 60 is not really my jam mm, I so see. you're 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 that's all you're What's that? It's super hard. That's the hardest part. Yeah, that is the hardest part. Yeah, it is. Guys, yeah, I have guys one like game design right now, but it's light and fluffy, and that's that's it. But yeah, it's it's too hard. I'm not I'm not a Travis Chance. I'm no genius. I'm no <laughs> Sen, I'm no Jesse. I just come in and add the add the flavoring. You guys make the meals, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and Travis, tell us what's going on with you right now. I understand there's a, a little Kickstarter going on. Yeah, so Colossal Games um, I formed Colossal Games back in June of last year, uh, and our first game, and it, we were kind of just this weird, faceless Philip K. Dick corporation that was looming in the background, making constant announcements, um, and finally our first, you know, announcements like, "Oh, hey, we're." We bought the entire small box games catalog from John Cloudus, and we've signed this game. We have a Martin Walls game coming out, and um, but we had nothing. We have no actual physical product yet. So our first Kickstarter launched yesterday, and it funded in a couple hours. Uh, it's called Western Legends, mm -hmm. and we just hit a stretch goal right now: one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars and eight cents. Uh, so I like eight cents. That's awesome. That eight cents matters because oh, yeah. Kickstarter uh, take ten percent of that eight cents. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, and and uh, what's going on right now in your life, Nate? Um, I I know that you're back with IDW after a um, little yes. time away, and yep. but you're not, not in games. So tell us what are you doing with IDW, and what are you doing with games? Because there's something yeah. Interesting. Two different paths in life. So yeah, life took me away from IDW for a while to take a shot to, um, you know, see what could happen if, if someone tried to compete with Kickstarter. Um, and I will say I wasn't the one to tap out on that. I thought we were doing great and got told otherwise. Uh, but luckily, IDW always wanted me back the whole time I was gone. I left on very good terms. Um, and so a new special position opened up. That it was created for me. And so I work uh, as a business development manager directly for the CEO on all special projects. Um, so if it's not a comic book or it's not a board game, I'm making it. Uh, and that, that's my specialty. That's what I did for them before was I helped them launch the games division and three other divisions. And so now it's for them. Uh, and, and that's what's exciting to me is new stuff. Um, and then on the other side, I gone started signing games and, and working on a small game label mm -hmm. and they're very friendly on me continuing that and so uh i think you know jesse said um it'll be more public soon but you know we've got we've got a project going up february 6th and and it'll be a small goofy thing and that's how my brand will start with smaller things that i like 
Um, but yeah, so working on both sides, both gaming and um, books and puzzles and lunch boxes. I mean, pretty much anything. Just new and exciting every day is different. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so Jesse, let's let's get the show started. We we, as you guys know, who people who are longtime watchers, uh, we're making a little bit of a shift here and there. Yeah. Happy birthday to Eli to Monkey Number Two. I see him he, he is ten years old today. How come wow. you're on air? Why are you on air? Good night. Okay, go to bed. <laughs> boy. You didn't get yes. cake. All right, go eat some cake. Cake is good. Um, you can tell he's half Chinese because he actually likes cake. Um, anyway, <laughs> Chinese people and cake, not a thing. Uh, let's chat about what we're doing tonight. We are right. doing something a little different, a little wild. That's why we invited uh, Travis and Nate, because we think they will actually uh, humor us. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, Jesse, explain what we're going to try. Nate and I have been on, yeah, right? been on together in the past. Yes, this is like the second coming. Yep. Uh -oh. um, so yeah, so, so tonight's plan, uh, we're going to have the, the usual kind of interview conversation with these guys, pick their brains, get some knowledge out of them. Uh, but before and after that, we're going to try out some of our segment ideas. Um, so we're going to start with one that we, we came up with just for these guys, uh, partly yeah. inspired by, I think, a, a game that Nate's got out there in the world. Um, called uh, Publish, Play, or Pass. We figured since we've got two, uh, two game publishers, or yeah, game publishers on the show, we'd, we'd do something special with them that leveraged their expertise. So what's gonna happen for this is Sen and I are going to pitch you guys three games, and you will have to pick one to publish, one to play, and one to pass on, and talk a little bit about why you categorize these three game pitches in these ways. Um, then we'll do an interview, and then we're going to do another segment after the interview and get you guys to crush on some board games a little bit and tell everybody about some games you love and why you love them so. Uh, it's really fun. I love the new, I love the new bits. Let's play. All right. All right, Jesse. Uh, why don't you start, Jess? Great. Uh, sure. So um, I will uh, start with a game called Bloodlines. So in this game... Players are member play members of an ancient family line, and they're going to use inherited power to secure control over parts of a giant Gothic Victorian city with like big, cool cathedrals and and dangerous tunnels and sewers and and all that kind of great visual stuff. What you're going to do is you're going to use your inherited powers from your bloodline to do battle with other players, to increase your power, recruit followers. You're going to always have to make a choice between, you know, leveraging the power of your blood to get uh, advantages now at a cost because you're going to be weaker in subsequent games. So this game's got sort of a legacy campaign style element to it where the power that you've managed to manifest into your bloodline will pass down to your ancestors who you'll be playing in subsequent games. Um, the coolest parts about this game are uh, the game arc, which begins by using a city board more like a map uh, just to set up a scenario, but as you're playing, you're going to be filling out the city until the final game of the campaign where we're actually going to do battle over this city that we've been defining the pieces of while we've been building our ancestry and our bloodlines. Um, and then the second sort of nifty bit about the game uh, is in the design. It's sort of the broader theme is about inheritance, and this is a sort of light legacy, like light legacy elements to it, and the game will be designed to be re-gifted when it's finished. So when you're done with the game, you're going to pass that on to a friend or a family member, so the game itself uh, becomes inherited, just like the themes uh, of the game, like when you're playing across your different ancestral lines. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so we got we got bloodlines. Uh, the next one is Sky Spire. Okay, so Sky Spire is a game uh, where we're going to have tiles that are like floors of a building, and it's what it's a competitive game where we each have a building that we're we're making, and the tiles get placed down, and then you have to activate those tiles. Each tile gives you a uh, you know, different power to interact with your resources, uh, different po uh, powers to interact with the meeples that you're placing on tiles to gain the powers, to gain resources, to build more tiles. But the tiles you don't just place down on the, the board. Where we're going to place them on top of the meeples as if the meeples were infrastructure that add to the height 
of your thing. And then you build the next tile and next tile and next tile until you have this giant spire. Um, and you know how some games you're like counting floors and you have to go look at them and see how many things you use to build it? Well, we're going to do it backwards. We're going to calculate final score from not just how high it goes, but what's left in your in your stockpile you start off with a certain stockpile and that way it's going to be very scalable between multiple players and it's it's going to be the kind of game that you're really interested in what other people are doing on their turn so that you can take advantage of it on your turn and try to build your tower higher and higher and higher and get rid of all the floors that you have right and build this big Spire in the sky, and Sky Spire, hence the name, uh, is going to be sort of probably a theme punk, theme punk, <laughs> themed in like a steampunk. That's funny, uh, steampunk setting, just to get weird widgets and get some and gadgets and get some nice um, aesthetics to the game. Okay, so that's Sky Spire, and Jesse, what's game number three? Game number three is Battle of the Bands. Well, not really bands. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm not the best. Let's forget about the name. What's awesome about this no, game... No, that's what it's being it's, called. Yeah. Uh, what's awesome about this game is that it's a team battle game. Uh, each player is going to be one half of a DJ MC team competing to be the raddest um, DJ MC team in, in the area. Um, I mean, you really should have been pitching this one, son. All right, oh, so yeah. what's going to happen is the DJ player is going to spend the daytime hours searching for rare music and hot records in stores and in uh, garage sales, trying to build up their music collection in preparation for the battle, while their MC partner is going to be practicing their rhymes, so building their deck, but also spreading word about the upcoming battle and trying to get the audience sort of leaning on your side before the game even begins. And then once night falls the uh the mic drops and the battle begins teams are going to face off uh in a head-to-head -head match to win the hearts of members of the audience and so we're going to have this audience board um with some area control mechanisms where gaining control of one area will influence adjacent areas and so you're trying to use your actions and abilities to take control over a biggest portion of the audience and uh each of the dj and mc are going to use complementary game systems so the dj has got a disc-based rondel system so they're going to have little record discs that are actually rondels they're going to put them down and then do rondel style action selection with them to set up triggers for the cards that the MC is playing using a sort of deck building system where they built their deck during the day and now they're trying to play out their combos in sync with the DJ's um, the uh, rondel setups. The best coordinated team will win the audience and win the battle, win three battles, and you win the game. Hmm, mm, that's some stiff competition. Okay, so to... Uh... Travis and Nate, do you guys have any questions about any of the games? I that yeah, I have a question going to uh, Bloodline. All right. Yeah. Um, how, how do you win each individual game? Jesse, how do you win yeah. each individual game? Right. So yeah, each is, that, is that uh, straight combat knockout? Is it victory point? What was the win condition on Bloodline? Right. Uh, so Bloodline is uh, right. is uh, an area control game through through all of its layers. So um, in each individual game, it's like area control over a district of a city. Um, mm -hmm. And so you'll use combat potentially to knock people out of areas and take control of them, um, but also to sort of fight uh, monsters and neutral characters just to gain power, but not area. Okay. Um, and then the bigger game itself, you basically you take all of those little areas that we've established control over, and we're going to clip them together to make a big city board, and we're going to have an epic battle for all of it. But it'd be okay. it'd be like dudes on map in control. Okay, all right, that's fine. And then for the uh, music game, uh, player count. Uh, for uh. There would probably be a way to make it two player, but that would require special rules, but it'd have to be mm -hmm. even player counts. For, so four and six would be the, the sort of design okay. for player counts. Okay. Uh, my questions are good. I have my answers. Travis, go ahead and. Travis, you got questions? No. I no, got what I need. You're just that good. You. I'm a creature, I'm a creature of instinct. You got what I need. I'm not saying I'm that good. I'm just saying I'm I'm using the exact same kind of radar I would use if this were like not a hypothetical situation. Okay, but you say you're just a friend. Okay. <laughs> so you say All right. All right. So um, 
We got Sky Spire, which nobody asked any questions about. The uh, stacking upon meeples uh, tower building game set in a steampunk world. We got Battle of the Beats. We're gonna take that Jesse and change that to Battle of the Beats. It makes oh, that's sad. a good one. Uh, the multiplayer team, multi teamed team game of DJs and MCs uh, playing different styles of games, but as a team to win the hearts and minds of uh, hip hop heads out there. Yes. And then we have Bloodlines in which um, hashtag vampires are running around with a win con of controlling areas and districts of a city that probably has a Hellgate in it or something. Who knows? They're vampires. They like this type of <laughs> the thing. Hellgate? Yeah. Uh, you like Hellgate? Hell we'll tack that on in post. I yeah. got you. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Jesse, explain the rules. Well, so. Um... I don't know the best way to run this. Should we just get them both to to give us theirs, or did we start with like the the play and then the pass and then the publish? Um, I hadn't thought about yes. that at this point. I feel like Travis has a, a good gut and feels locked in. I'd say let him run his whole three first, and I'll all right, I'll Travis. All right, learn from the master. No, I'm not the master. And how dare you bring up my weight? Um, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so. Uh, Jesse, come on. What, what, what would you get? Which guess? Which one you think I would sign? Come on. Which one do I think you're gonna sign? Yeah. I got. I got a hunch that you're gonna want to sign Sky Spire. <clears throat> no. I think. I, would, I think I would play Sky Spire. I would pass on the music one, and I would want to sign, publish the crazy ambitious one that could make money on Kickstarter if it could be executed correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's, there you go. That's, that sounds very Travis, very Travis. So Travis is saying he would play, he'll play uh, Sky Spire, he will pass on Battle of the Beats, and he would sign uh, Bloodlines. Okay, that yeah, over yeah. to Nate. What do you? What's your? What's your deal? Uh, all right. So I mean, Travis is right, but. <laughs> just because you know, uh, but just because you know, Sen and I share a love of music and hip hop and records and all that. I would play Battle of the Beats. Um, there's no way I, that would certainly, if this was gun to my head of any of them publishing, this would obviously hit the cutting room floor first. Uh, the restrictions of four, six, or eight players is is really not you know something I want to explore. I hate music as a theme in games. I think it's really hipstery. But I would play it because I actually like that stuff, and I would hope that we could put some Easter egg tracks in there. Uh, I would pass completely on Skyscrape or whatever. I don't need to city build ever. Um, I'm cool. Heart like just I I'm all about flavor and like just I I, I don't need it. What's it do different? It it, it was just a. Nothing in there was grabbed me that said, "Oh, that's the thing, the new thing that I want to play." So, uh, and then I would take Bloodline, I would publish it, but uh, I would ask if it could be rethemed slightly to not be vampires and maybe fit into uh, a little more gunplay, <laughs> and then slam it into one of my current universes for games. So uh, th that would be the winner. I think you understand what I'm saying, uh, and and yeah, that that's right. That's the pop on Kickstarter is definitely Bloodline. Uh, the uh, the thought of regifting that game to come up with the the uh, thing that people that that broke people bitch about about legacy games of oh my god I can't resell it and it's like dude you got more hours of fun out of that game than any game in your collection but now I can regift it so okay cool you've solved a major problem with the last of the people who haven't conformed to legacy. Sounds great. I'd be in on publishing. Cool. All right. And, and I like that you guys are talking about the model of publishing as well. What if you were a more traditional publisher and you didn't use Kickstarter and you didn't have that campaign, you didn't have stretch goals, <laughs> would you change your mind in terms of what you would pass, what you would play and what you would sign? Uh, so for so, did you uh, do you want Nate to go first? No, no, go ahead, Travis. So, so for me, like as soon as you started saying a bloodline, it, it was the uh, it was the instant reaction was this sounds really cool. 
holy crap, I'm going to end up doing like 800 hours of development work and probably designing 40% of this game. Uh, that was my immediate thought. But, but then on the other side, I was like, wow, what a fantastic, what a fantastic story, right? Like that's the story, like the, the, the pitch to that, especially in, in a Kickstarter format is, is so good. If you said just a traditional publishing route, I think I would still pick like stuff, active stealth style games, right? Like Gloomhaven, part of why Gloomhaven is so just crazy successful is like the, the absolute monstrous spectacle that it is. Right, that comes in this giant box, and it's all these things, and it's excessive. So, to me, the Sky Spire is that what it's called? Sky Spire? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's, that sounds like something like 2010 kind of Ravensburger would have put out a long time ago. I don't know, maybe there's some, maybe there's more to it. It just, I agree with Nate, like, it doesn't feel like there's a story there, it feels just kind of like a uh, me- mechanisms, right? Like there's no, th- there's no blood in it. And and I totally agree about trying to capture music. Like I feel like a lot of the people that are involved in gaming aren't people who have enjoyed, you know, like I was a literally a professional drummer until I was 32 years old. I lived in New York city. I DJ for four years of my life. That was my job at a couple, two or three different places in New York every weekend. But there's not a lot of gamers who can say, I'm not saying I'm better. I'm saying I had a very different experience. I always liked gaming, but I, you know, I played music and I was involved in those things. I think there's a lot of people who are involved in gaming that probably didn't have those types of experiences. So I don't know that those things are that theme compelling. Maybe it's even kind of off-putting. Maybe, maybe it reminds them of people who crapped on them in high school or, you know, they were put upon throughout their life. That, so to me, like that, that's where, that's my mentality. Um, so I, I think, I, I think my ordering would still stay the same, even if okay. it was no Kickstarter involved. All right. And Nate, what about you? Would your order stay the same? No, I mean, if I'm, well, like when you say traditional, so if I'm who, like if I'm trying to get these units into target, is, if, is that my play? Um, maybe I go crazy and publish the music game to go into target. I mean, city the just the city theme is done like look at quadropolis look at you know some city games i might have been involved with that certainly had good numbers and are falling off uh i i just that's a theme i'd stay away from so maybe i throw the music and i mean uh, target just picked up captain sonar so someone at target is now paying attention to games and they're not just like they're not just going oh this moves the most Someone there now has opinion and is is <laughs> saying I likes I no and that's a bad thing like this is a truly bad thing that Target is now like cool so we're gonna put it in there like this is the end of the board game section in Target in my opinion Captain Sonar okay. shouldn't be in Target let's, so, let's talk about that in a second but, I'm gonna table yeah, that one that, yeah that, that, no we can we can go there but that means to me they now hired a nerd that likes board games. So, okay, can I sell this nerd that I also, I mean, all four of us are probably DJs and battle rappers and this and that. So I'm going to try and sell that new angle instead of a city thing. And then they're not, the component pack out and price point for Bloodline, I'm sure is not going to fit that. So if I'm going mass down the middle, I'm trying something crazy and I'm going with Battle of the Beats. Uh, And then I'm going to play as my second place, the city game with the target buyer. And if they love it, I'm going to go there and I'm going to say these components are cool. And then I'm going to completely pass on bloodline as a mass play because it's not a mass play. Hmm. Okay. So if you went to mass, we might switch things up. Cool. That, that was kind of neat, Jesse. That sort of worked. Yeah. What do you think? I actually really like that. That was awesome. Um, All right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, quick, quick segue though, captain sonar and target end of times question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's the end. Of, it's the end of times for target board games because um captain sonar is a game but it's not the right game for that audience so captain sonar is played what best at f- eight people uh um, you can the one in uh, so the one in target is is a is a simplified one that plays less players it's just called sonar yeah oh, okay because cool. we haven't risen to the rank all right of so then there there you go so they they've made a target product like anything else but it's just, it seems not quite in touch with that audience. And it seems like that means that they're not thinking of moving units anymore. They're thinking of opinion. 
And when you start to add an opinion to then you're right, and you're going to start seeing weird plays. And so I, I, I don't want people to get a bad taste in their mouth that they bought sonar for their grandkid, took it home, couldn't figure it out. And then we're like, you know what? Screw target board games. And then didn't come back and buy more. I'd rather they bought code names for life and, you know, Catan and pandemic and just took home the easy stuff and then worked their way to a board game store. Whereas now I feel like if, if they're going to run into a captain sonar or a, uh, like what, what are we going to see next in there? Like what level up? Like Splendor's perfect. It's on shelf now. I love it. But keep it there. Don't, don't, don't take these flyers. Like don't, don't do that target. Interesting. Don't, don't, don't get crazy. Travis, yeah. Travis, what's your opinion on, on games like sonar at target? You, you do realize one of my business partners is the Arno from Matago, right? <laughs> He's one of the owners of Colossal Games. Um, I don't know the, one of the people who make uh, Captain Sonar. Um, so look, I'm not saying it's not a great oh, game. Oh no, it's, I just, it's amazing. I, I think it's funny. I just I know I know I, I yeah. It's a funny coincidence that, that that particular game came up. Um, I mean, listen, I <laughs> I every time I think I I figured it out, the pendulum swings the other way. Right? Totally. Like Gloomhaven will forever boggle my mind. Like totally. we were, we were in this period where like, it felt like even medium weight games were just, no one was playing long games at that point. Right. You know, it was like two years almost of like after love letter, everyone's just playing filler games and like 30 minute games. And it was, instead of trying to play something like super long and meaningful, it was like, let's play something that's like 45 minutes at the most and 45 minutes felt long. And then Gloomhaven. Yep comes along and provides more content than any human being can rationally play in a market where people are playing games one time, one time. Most people are playing games one time and they're playing them wrong. <laughs> like people, people are jumping into the hobby at the deep end of the pool, you know, Kickstarter craziness. There's people who yeah. have, you know, I personally have probably 400 games I've never played um, yeah. that I've opened and just like, you know, looked at the components and punched them and put them back on a shelf and said, Oh, one day I'll have time to play them and I won't. So, totally. so, so I guess my counter to Nate's comment, which I'm not saying I disagree with Nate, I think what he said was pretty spot on is it feels like, like did you, did you hear like BGG, uh, had 5 million unique uh, user hits last month. And I think a couple years ago they had 3 million was their, highest they almost doubled <laughs> like in a year like that's it's crazy like the hobby is rampant so the question for me or the question from me rather is are are is the consumer base is it like oh cool i play ticket to ride uh, now i'm playing home haven <laughs> like <laughs> is, right. that the, is that the log leap like is that is that like how quick uh, the, the progress goes and i mean it, it feels like because of <clears throat> this world that we live in and i'm not trying to sound like some sort of light here but because of things like meetup.com and uh, gaming groups gaming cafes like you could walk in totally blind and know nothing about gaming and and, and then a more experienced gamer could sit down and walk you through the process because they need a body and the next thing you know you're like well that wasn't that hard can i come back next week and play again you know let's play 20 campaigns of gloomhaven uh so <clears throat> i feel like it's not an illogical question to ask if people are kind of their tastes are being a little more sophisticated like we've, we've obviously mm -hmm. seen price points kind of slowly ascend over the last couple of years and it, it, it's to the point where like spending a hundred dollars on a game really doesn't feel bad anymore i mean like, even like star wars rebellion you think about star wars rebellion like yes it's star wars but it's a two-player game right like right. it's a hundred dollar two-player game uh that like it's not like it's a hundred dollar two player game, like a, like an awesome version of Rhino Hero, where you get to own a real rhinoceros. Or something. <laughs> uh, it's it's like a pretty specific audience, and it's like super high up on BGG, and there's a lot of people like it. Yes, now would it have done as well without the IP? I doubt it, but still, it's super interesting to me that that game that's so in a way like play style wise is so niche can be that popular. Um, same thing with Gloomhaven. Like holy crap! Like how can uh, how can this be as popular as it is? And it's undeniably, you know, popular. Um, so I don't know, I guess that beckons the question, like, 
are are people becoming more advanced like from the get-go like how much have tastes changed obviously there's so many games that are coming out i mean like where are micro games now like remember two years ago dad one and their brother i'd sit down and have like 45 games pitched to me in five minutes because they were all micro games uh and i haven't seen a micro game in i don't know nine months a year <laughs> right yeah right. i mean I, I think they're still there they're just they've now become their own little part of it right it's not like this rush to make them anymore uh, but i still think they're a part of the i can't system. think of a micro game that's come out recently i mean i can't think uh, of one especially one of them. what about no. all the 18 card games are they micro games or those are absolute oh. micros but none's popped Right? Oh, sure. I mean, so it depends what you think about as popped. Are we talking like love letter level of popped? Or are we saying, yeah. hey, somebody's published a game. Okay. Off, right? okay. yeah. yeah, of course. But are we uh, saying like, you know, God, a, a game that will see a second or third printing? Like, will I play that game again or will I read half the rules, get it and give it away? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and maybe there is some sophistication or some pseudo sophistication of the consumer um, as they get led up the tiers. And maybe that's what Target is seeing, that they don't have anything for a return customer that has gone through the first X number of tiers and they'd like something. I don't know if it that's going to push yeah, you. It might be forecasting. It, yeah. It, it literally might be product forecasting. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what Target buyers. I mean, I've had the opportunity to pitch to Target. Um, like they were interested in Kodama at one point and then they're like, eh, no, nah, it's, it's not right for us. And I mean, I would argue of any of the games I made, Kodama or something like Kodama or Ninja Camp would be the one that would, would have any op shot in that. But hey, maybe they know something I don't know, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm still waiting for Junk Art to get in there. So who knows, right? That should. I would expect Junk Art to land in there, honestly. Yeah. Well, but, especially with the plastic version. So well, that's yeah, that, I, expect, the, I expect plastic, plastic version Junk Art to be in Target. Time. We'll see. Yep. We'll see. Um, okay, so that was that was really more interesting than I thought it would be. The whole pitching and <laughs> leading to other conversations. Uh, Jesse has a point. I just want to throw in one other like wild possibility. Maybe our old vision of gateway games is wrong. And oh, that, I think it is. I've been thinking that, that this, like, year, and this like <laughs> vision of like a, a you know a simplified Euro like Ticket to Ride or Catan as like the ideal way of getting people into the hobby is just not the best way to get most people into the hobby. And what Kickstarter is allowed to happen and how it's helped the hobby grow is there's these crazy things like Gloomhaven that make people who are Skyrim addicts go, hey, I can play something that I recognize. Uh, that would be fun with my friends and people are willing to learn things if they're interested in learning them. I mean, give people credit. Who knows? Okay. Who knows? Anyway. Cool. Yeah. Um, did you, is it K-Tan? Did you just say K-Tan? As no. in like, as if it like K-Tel from the seventies? Mm. No. Absolutely not. Absolutely that would be embarrassing. <laughs> we did not get that on air that you said K-Tan. Awesome. Uh, so what are we going to next, Jesse? Where are we going to next? Interview okay, so. time. We're All supposed right. to do the interview time. Okay, so Ooh. now we go to an interview. I don't Deep know what we're doing. Deep so cuts. I'm going to let Jesse lead sure. this one. All right, go well, ahead. Well, th th this is just the usual meeple syrup thing. Oh, uh, same old, same old. Okay. Where That's we just ask questions different. until we're bored. Um, so, uh, I mean, following up on, on what we were just talking about, I think this is a, a good place to start. Um, you, you guys have both started again, mul started multiple times in this industry. Um, and it's changing, it's growing, it's getting bigger, um, as, as you'd said repeatedly just now. So how do you make space for yourself in an industry that's this big and growing this fast? Is there, I'll, you know, I'll let the guy with the huge oh. successful Kickstarter go first. <laughs> uh, so when you say, it. how do you, could you rephrase the question? I'm sorry, I didn't understand exactly. Yeah, how do you get noticed? How do you stand out? How do you get off the ground running and have a chance at succeeding? Well, that's easy, Jesse. You get a big, really loud. Plastic, have you considered you plastic? <laughs> Okay, Travis, give us your answer. In terms of, in terms of as an individual, as a, as a game designer, as a, as a product? Um, wh why not all three? Individual, game designer, product. I mean, 
So, so I don't think a good game is enough anymore. Um, I think to have a great game. Uh, I think we, <clears throat> and kind of uh, dovetailing a little bit off, <clears throat> excuse me, off of the the micro game. I think what Kickstarter and the little micro game search did was it actually uh, it's it's allowed. A is Travis uh, lagging? I think he is. Yeah. Oh, Travis. Okay. Oh, he looks Travis. Like, All right. He's like, he's like frozen. Travis. All right. He so is. Okay. All right. I, I can uh, I can pick up while we wait for him if you'd like. Okay. Am I back? Am I back? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're you back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, All right. So answer the question again. <laughs> back, baby. Sorry, guys. I'm back. The great game is not enough. What the? The so great game is uh, not enough. Think, what things like micro games? Yep. There you go. Keep yep. going. So, so so things like micro games were an opportunity for people who to kind of like fast track the process of pitching a game and, and getting a game published. And I think what we saw, I mean, as a guy who's, who's, you know, signed 30 plus games, like what I saw was a lot of, and I mean, I'll just, I'll be, I'll be blunt. Like I saw a lot of really untalented people that were just kind of trying their hand at something and didn't really, they didn't really maybe necessarily have the skill set or the background or did the research, they were kind of undisciplined maybe. Uh, is the, and I think that we had this amazing amount of overwhelming amount of games that came out and a lot of them just really kind of sucked. Um, a lot of them were really kind of half-baked. They were under super underdeveloped. I mean, and that's one of the things with Kickstarter is you, you do, because of Kickstarter, a lot of games that probably would not have survived the traditional uh, publisher process they, they would have probably never seen the light of day. And so Kickstarter is awesome because it allows people to uh, overcome that obstacle, right? And, and, it, and, it, and it's changed the, the standard. But at the same time, <laughs> I think it's allowed a lot of untalented uh, kind of dribble to enter in. And, and, and in the process, it, it, it weakened – sorry, I'm going I'm to answer your question here. Uh, okay. So, so it, it weakened, uh, it, it lowered the expectation, and I think it lowered the bar to a detriment to the point now where, like, the games that we see that are really succeeding, you know, there's probably, like, four games a year that sell over 100,000 units, and there's, like, one of those might continue to sell games. There's just not a lot of games that, that push into that upper tier. And I think what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see people kind of try to work around and make stuff that's awesome like things that are really good be really thoughtful about making a game like really can try to figure out how to make it unique and interesting and um i think that obviously having a great game is is number one no matter if you're a publisher you're the designer whatever like if you have a killer product if you have something that people want if you have something that people want to know about in a in an overcrowded market space i think that's key in the in the tirade. Okay, so um, just to paraphrase, to make sure I've got it. So uh, <laughs> a, you need a great game to stand out. Uh, sometimes Kickstarter allows companies that, or designers, publishers, etc., that <laughs> stand out, uh, stand out um, for better or for worse, uh, because there's a little literal lack of a gatekeeper in that situation, and that um, really having that great game is inevitably at the end of the day, what is going to lead to uh, making an impression both on the market, on the hotness list, BGG, whatever you want to say, and on <clears throat> the hearts and minds of the consumers. Did I get it all? Yes. All right? okay, Basically, cool. yes. You got okay. it. Nate, what about you? What are your thoughts on that in terms of, uh, crowdfunding, gatekeeping, gate great games. What do you think? How do you make an impression that lasts these days? Okay, so I will tell you my company's plan. Do we have a name for that company yet? It's called Bread and Circuses. Yeah. Oh absolutely. right, I totally yeah. forgot. About that. Yeah, so we're Bread and Circuses, uh, which goes back to a lovely uh, phrase that was used in Rome. Uh, to distract the poor, um, the the ruling class use bread and circuses to That's tell right. them as, as a distraction for how bad life was getting. And that, it's, it's timely for now. Uh, call me lefty, whatever. Um, so I thought this was a great name. Um, 
So my take on how we're going to succeed as a company is we're going to be radically transparent. Um, we're going to go hard on theme and we're going to uh, prepare a lot of content. And so what that means is that I'm not signing any dwarven mining or fuel <laughs> growing, fuels growing games. I always go right to dwarven mining, which is great because my my great friend Daryl, like the one game I fought for from him, is a dwarven mining game, and I just shit yeah. on that thing nonstop. Do you, do you uh, know how I hate dwarf themed games? This is like a big thing for me. It's funny. That is why I'm, I'm already my in the head chat. Off over here. I'm already in the chat admitting I'm just a dumber version than you and we shouldn't be on this show anymore together because I'm just, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. No more dwarf thief games. So uh, my company will be doing two paths, which is one path is highly thematic brands and those brands uh, will, in, will be universes. They'll be Marvel universes uh, essentially with several different games living in the same path so that you can live in there and the, the content's ready, there's stories ready, there's art ready, and you can just live in this verse. And so we have, at this point, three verses launching. Uh, and then my second path, which is funny because we're all talking trash on it, but the other version of games we're doing are, are micro games intentionally, and that is uh, purely to crowd build. I don't care if I make any money on these games. Uh, I will be launching several micros on, on Kickstarter that have for interactive marketing opportunities, and that's to get emails. I am essentially having you pay me to give you my email, your email address, and that that's what's going to happen. Uh, and so, like, and I say this very bluntly because that's the other thing about my brand is that I do, my partner and I have recorded every step up to this moment. Uh, we'll be dropping podcasts the day we go live that talk about the very real decision making that goes into how to compete in a crowded market. Um, so that's it. So we'll be setting up a lot of light jab games where you can get them five, 10, 15 bucks. And then once a quarter, we're going to come at you and ask you for 50 bucks. And mm -hmm. then we're going to give you content in between. Look at where the world's going. Um, it, you know, it's going into these content silos. And so everything you should be working towards is trapping someone in your silo so that every day uh, from our brand, from Bread and Circuses, every single day of the week, there's going to be content from us. There's going to be articles, podcasts, all this kind of stuff leading up to that month's micro or that quarter's larger game. And it's just to keep you with us. To, it's, a, it's a Patreon model without Patreon, essentially. Keep, can I keep you with me? to avoid having you go and look at Colossal, who makes great games. But can I be entertaining enough that my mediocre games, plus my fun, you're like, yeah, I'll stay with Nate. I'll give him my money. Because there's only so much room for your money. And so that that's kind of our plan. And we're just going to be radically transparent about it. We're going to run our things. And the the plan is, you know, three to five years, we have the Malar World deal with Netflix. That's That's what I'm building towards. Hmm. Interesting. 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 That that is uh, very blunt and ambitious. That's that's. Those are both interesting things. Yeah, that's and it. Be part that's of it. I, mean, I can go uh, on, as go on. I think there's obviously more than just having a great game. But if you want to say the overarching comment, I think it's you got to have a you got to have something that's special, right? I mean, like that's this game that I this Western Legends game. And I'm not just trying to plug. I, like I saw it in an plug your game, dude. It's dope. No, 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 no. I'm, I, seriously. I, <laughs> Don't feel bad. I'm plugging again. I wanted it. And I Don't. knew it was going to be a tremendous amount of, uh, of development work. Uh, this is a first-time designer. He's French. He, uh, Herve's, his name's Herve. He, he's French. Uh, and he, um, uh, he, it's his first game. He, he, there was a tremendous language barrier between us. So imagine trying to work on a sandbox uh, with a first time designer who, you, you know, I don't speak French. Thank God he spoke some English, but it would take him hours to write like testing results and things like he would spend like three hours. And he, wow. you know, it would take me like, that's crazy. You know, yeah. And I mean, I'll be doing, yeah, I'll be doing no first time designers. You're, you're a ballsy man. You're, you, you go, you go after it, but I'm only working with friends. <laughs> that's it but uh, i mean and and, and i thought that's I mean, so cool i thought the game was special right and like that's a, that's a cool story right that's a cool story here's a it's a this is a french guy he's he's a talented artist he's been working on this game for 11 years 11 years of his life he's played this with his friends 
And, um, you know, I got to come along and, and be a part of that and like, and, and help uh, enrich the experience and provide my experience. And, and all of that was, all of that was awesome. But really fundamentally why I wanted that game, why I chose that game to be our first game was because I knew it was special. I knew it was, it had the potential for greatness and I knew it had all the little bells and not only just bells and whistles to, to kind of grab people's attention, but to also keep them playing the game so that the game has a long tail. It's not just, oh, cool, we made Kickstarter money, now what? That's not enough. You know, every game that I've made, every game that I've made has sold twice as much in retail at the very least than it did on Kickstarter. And this is my 16th Kickstarter, and I've, all 16 have been successful. They've been successful to varying degrees, and I've, I've never cracked a half a million yet. I've been damn close, but I've never cracked a half a million yet. But, um, uh, yeah. Very cool. Jesse, um, it's getting to be around 11.07. Well, it's exactly 11.07 right now, Eastern Standard Time. Mm -hmm. So uh, for you, it's 8.07, and yep. I think for Nate as well. Um, but let's let's go on. Let's move on and get to the next part of it so that we can then work on some of the rest of our little uh, thingy bingies, our segments. What's the next segment, Jess? The next segment is Game Crush. Uh, so in this segment, we're going to ask our guests to tell us about a game that they have a crush on. Uh, this is something that you love um, and a game that you love, that you may have always loved. Uh, so tell us what the game is. Tell us what you love about it. What about its design just makes you so, you know, crush after it like that, you know, high school thing. I'm really bad at intros. I got to work on this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in addition to telling us about the game, I mean, uh, it could be fun also to reflect a little bit on how that game and your crush on it has affected your your career path, even if in a small way, through this industry. All right, Nate, you're up. Uh, I I obviously, I mean, can one of you just name what I'm going to say? Uh, well, there's, no thing. there's only two choices, really, Nate. One of them is uh, one of them is the resistance, and the other one would be poker. So I'm not really sure which one you're going to talk about. Close, close. No, uh, coup. Oh yeah, is my coup. game crush of all right. game crushes. I can't believe. Yeah, no, no, no. Coup is my game crush of all game crushes. Uh, Ricky is the man. I would say uh, everyone knows coup. So I'm going to ramble about it for about four minutes anyway. But if you <laughs> want a game from Ricky that you haven't played, pick up Melee which is a dope, nasty area control game that plays in about 20 minutes and has this amazing drafting bidding system once you go to the advanced mode. That's so cool. But let's go back to Coup. Uh, Coup has been my favorite thing forever. Every When they put me in the Ninja Turtles game, it still says I claim Duke, like my, my custom card. Uh, my Twitter bio probably says it like, Coup is my everything two things as my crush has evolved i bought the expansion to go to 10 player and all that uh not a huge fan of 54 i don't like all the extra rolls but tight keep keep the original set plus the one roll that lets me look at one of your cards to add an extra bluff element um but but in house we do two coup uh house rules and i find these to be so just juicy and beautiful so the first one is uh, once you're dead, we mix your rolls back into the deck. So it's not so obvious to people that, you know, all the Dukes are out or all that. Uh, and I, I think that's very important. I think you have to do that. Uh, the game is way better with that version um, it, because late stage bluffing is important because clues, coup is an elimination game. And when you allow, and it's an elimination bluffing game, and when you allow too much information to become deterministic in public, a lot of what the game is. Uh, the second thing we're just playing with now is called the Call Your Coup variant. And if you haven't played Coup, you're given two roll cards. Every player at the table has two roll cards. Every player at the table is collecting currency, using currency to use, activate the rolls. It's an elimination game. I kill a couple of your, when both of your rolls are dead, you're gone. Uh, one thing you can do in the game is accumulate seven coins and auto kill someone. The call your coup thing is uh, beautiful in that I have to correctly say, Jesse, I'm cooing you. And in the regular rule set, 
you would just lose a life. But in call your coup, I would say, Jesse, I'm cooing you Duke. And that means I have to know that you have a Duke card, which means I have to have read you in some way beyond just guessing or eliminating you. And what that does is fix the end game, which can become pure math. Uh, without call your coup, it can just be a race to seven coins and kind of two players can look at it. And just like chess, you can go uh, four moves checkmate. And that's true. But if you play with this call your coup variant, I'm telling you, you can be running a deep game long bluff. That's just beautiful. And and coup is all about tearing it, telling a narrative. It's a, it's a beautiful game. Uh, if you have a chance, get the version with the Brazilian artist who uh, just did these beautiful watercolors for the roles. That's crazy. Uh, and then check out melee because you've already heard about coup. You don't need me telling you about coup, but check out melee. It's a really dope little game. Uh, just the nastiest area control that plays in the fastest way possible. So, and I, uh, I officially have a crush. How, how has that, how has that game changed your life, uh, in terms of the board game industry and your path? Yeah. Uh, distillation. So, yeah. So it, it coup informs every single thing that I think about a board game. Um, and it, it changed how I sign games. It changed how I think of. Uh, my specialty is in building licensed games. So, it, um, you know, my one of my designs is The Godfather, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not a great game. I designed it. Whatever. But what Ku taught me was, there you go. There's that hot art. So good. Uh, but what That Coup, is the Duke, of course. I had to find the right one. Yeah, that's, that's dope. So what Ku taught me was the next day, you're not going to talk about, oh, we had a great game of economic placement and I edged you out by a few points. What you're going to talk about is that one time that Nate Bluff Duke eight turns in a row and never had a Duke. Like it's moments. It's the moments that take your breath away. You know, <laughs> like think of it like a diamond commercial. Come on. So that's who taught me that in, de, in a design space. So every game I look for, I don't want the whole game to be good. I want certain moments to be so great. You can't not talk about them. And Ku changed my life because of that, because certain crazy moves you gamble off you do in Ku the next day, where you won't talk about a moment of Lords of Water Deep or Pandemic or this or that, but Ku you will. And so taking that to a design space for Godfather, you know that game for Godfather, obviously you had to do it. And the one thing that had to happen is Mafia, if you play that genre of games, there's an eyes closed phase. And uh, the biggest moment in the Godfather movie is the guy going to sleep and waking up with a horse head in his bed. And so there was no way for me to design a Godfather version of Mafia that didn't also take the highlight moment and pack it in. And so we created a special rule. What happens is at some point someone's going to open their eyes and there'll be a horse head in front of them. And that moment, giving players that, like connecting them, license and gameplay perfectly that moment it's not a perfect game but got a moment to talk about and and that's what ku taught me is like i look for the five spikes in adrenaline in a game i don't i don't look for a even path i want you to have moments you'll be like you can send and in my group at least we're very mean people and so the next day we're gonna send talking trash moments and if i don't give you a game where you can talk a little trash on a particular stab or a particular highlight I haven't done my job, in my opinion, especially as a licensed whore. Uh, you know, you, you know, if you're playing a Star Wars Empire Strikes Back game and you don't get a hand cut off or you don't escape Hoth by the skin of your teeth, who cares about the game? Like, give me the one moment, you know? And so that's what Ku taught me. All right, cool. Awesome. Travis, tell us about your crush. <clears throat> um, my... <laughs> So it, it, it's funny because I never really sat down and looked at my top games. I just kind of had this running list of games that I would claim was my top 10. And then I really wrote down my top 10 and I realized almost all of them were area control games. Uh, and of those, the game, like I don't, I lose all the time. Like the, the kind of the, the play test style and the developer style I use and you, uh, Sin and Jesse, you guys know Nick, uh, well enough to know Nick is very like, you know, Matt wasn't very math minded. So Nick was my old business partner at action phase. Um, so 
Nick would get in there and try to break the game. And I was just kind of like the guy touching all the walls and turning all the knobs and pushing all the buttons, you know, like a kid in a candy shop type thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't care if I win a game, but I care if I win at dominant species. And if I don't win at dominant species, I get very upset. Um, I, I really love that game profoundly. Uh, I want to republish it with non band aid colored components and actual cool minis for the little creatures. I think that game is so mean and so good. It's just, uh, it's my favorite, 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 favorite area control game by far. So what's, what's keeping you from republishing that? The fact that they won't let me. I contacted them and they won't let me. <laughs> uh, they like their Band-Aid colors, Travis. Yeah, they're like, no, we're going to give it another shot. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, so how did it change my life? Uh, yeah. How did, it, how did it change your your career path in, in games and design and or in publishing? Well, I mean... So I don't know that it really changed my life. I mean, I used to play it all the time. I, I used to play it when I lived in New York City with one of the guys who was, it was the kid, the guy who played Mike TV in the original Willy Wonka movie. Nice. I'm not okay. kidding. And like we would play, and we would just like fight all the time about it. One time I, I went to do a hand gesture and I literally flipped the board two and a half hours into the game and sent like 300 cubes or something <laughs> flying into the air. Um, so I don't know that it really changed my life. I, I guess it's interesting to me that it's one of the only types of games that I care if I win because I genuinely don't care if I win, uh, at all, uh, in games other than really that game and, and like it kind of competitive, like, you know, I net runner and stuff like that when I used to play that. Um, I mean like a game, I guess I'm kind of breaking the rules here, but like a, the game that kind of changed my life was Cyclades. Mm -hmm. um, I played that, and then that made me inspired me to make my first game, Infamy, which was very much a love letter to Cyclades, and uh, that that's why I started making games. So, is that how you got? Is that why you got hooked up with Betago? No, I mean I so like in my top ten is like Inish, Cyclades, Kemet. Okay, so all of the games that they make. So well, all the area control games they yeah. make. Like right. so. Um, yeah, like it's awesome to to work with Arno from Matago, and you know, like he he's made games that I love, like truly, like truly love, truly love. Like I think Inish is so cool and so smart. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Cyclades kind of informed my uh, initial opinions on how I wanted to make a game, um, and, and I think the thing that Inish and Kimmet and Cyclades all have is they have this moment where one person's winning and we go, okay, Jesse's winning. So the three of us are going to stop Jesse from winning. Right. And then suddenly now Nate's starting to win. So then me and sin are like, all right, Jesse, we're letting you back in, help us stop Nate. <laughs> and then it, all three, all three of those games have that moment where it's like two or three players are in contention to win. And, and it's just like this really like you're knuckling and scraping to get to victory. Um, it's, it's, and there's like one pivotal moment where someone either makes a mistake or the other person outsmarted uh, the other ones uh, that I think is, and then I agree with Nate, like it's that we, in, in our company, we call it the endorphin rush. If there's no endorphin rush, if there's no, uh, you know, uh, moment of satisfaction in the game, the game is not good. Like one of, one of the jokes I always make is if a game, if people just use the word interesting to describe a game, the subtitle for interesting is it wasn't fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's the corollary, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's like it wasn't fun. It, it was it, it was neat. It had cool, you know. It was, but it wasn't fun. So, yeah, all right, that was my long-winded answer. No, that's all right. We have a, a a word that we use in in therapy. It's fascinating. Ah. You ever hear me say the word fascinating? You know that something's going on. <laughs> something's mm -hmm. wrong. All right, Jesse. Uh, let's yeah. let's do the outro. Yeah. So. Um... It's tradition, after all. I don't think this segment will ever leave us, uh, which is each of our guests, um, Nate first and then uh, Travis, if you could give one piece of advice to all game design designers out there, new or old, what would that piece of advice be? Starting with Nate. Oh, um, don't 
not take an opportunity. Um, the way I got into this industry was by emailing the same guy for seven years. And then I got in. Uh, and, you know, the amount of people who have come up to me at shows and said, I want to do this thing. I want to do what you do. And who I've given my card to and who <coughs> don't send the email. It's a crazy amount of people. And just, just don't. If you get, if someone gives you a crack like a sliver to climb in through. Don't stop. Don't stop. That's your opportunity. That's, that's it. Like you get so many chances, like just keep on it. Uh, and I, Oh man, it, it just, it bums me out the amount of people who say they want this with all their heart and then get the shot from me or from anybody. I'm, and I'm a nobody, but still I can help you somehow. I can help you get a game published and they just don't. So if you see that sliver, bust through it like with everything you have and do not stop so don't not take an opportunity excellent travis what's your advice to all oh man he was he like gave this uplifting advice i kind of want to give like bull crushing advice well that's oh your, no if that's, you suck get the hell out of our industry that's, Tell that's them. your jam that's your jam travis so <laughs> yeah, go ahead. you know ahead, crush, crush some souls man hey crush your head go with your instinct uh, uh, Good's not enough. Good is not enough. Okay. Like, your game yeah. shouldn't exist just because you made it. Like Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park, <laughs> like the, the quote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you spend so much time wondering if you could do it. You never asked yourself if you should. <laughs> like, like that, that is genuinely, I, and, and I agree to some degree with, with Nate. I actually had a game designer the other night. I sent him feedback and I sent him detailed feedback. I was like, I think there's something in your game. I think, it, it's a long way from that, but I can see it and here's how to do it. And then his reply was, uh, thanks for the lengthy feedback. It would have been better if you just would have said no thanks. And I what? was like, <laughs> 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 that's the exact same feedback I gave just on a better take, man. I, I, and I don't do that. I mean, Jesse, you know, from working with me, I don't, I don't just give a canned response. Like I oh. always am genuine. I always try to, to give some sort of direction or guidance because I'm super, you know, I've genuinely. Genuinely uh, lagging, but I'll finish up for Travis genuinely for a second. Lagging. That uh, Travis, uh, if you know, if you know Travis or have met Travis, um, you know, he's, a, he's got a strong personality, right? We can talk about yeah. him because he's not really here. Mm -hmm. um, so Travis mm -hmm. is a really strong personality, and he's great if you get to know him. And if you don't know him, he may rub you one way or the other. You know, you may like him, you may not. But I'll be 100% honest with you, because Travis is now live. Um, no, I'll be 100% honest. That Travis's feedback is 100% some of the most heartfelt and well-thought-out feedback that you're ever going to get from anybody ever. And it is honest. And it is legit. And all he's trying to do is help you make a better game. And right. you're you're basically telling me that people are looking the gift horse in the mouth. And no, and you can yeah, you can tie that back to what I said of like look at you know like hey, take that opportunity. But like, dude, if a Travis Chance is going to give you notes, and you're just like, eh, I don't want your notes. Like, that's the same thing as not emailing me when I say email me. Like. That's one of the best in the biz who wants to take time out of his day. Like he thought about you. The fact that he had to think about you means he didn't think about something else. I actually read, you know, and I it's read, like, ugh. I reached it's out. so gross when you don't want to listen to that. I reached out. I reached out to that individual. Um, well, they actually friended me on Facebook after they, you know, were clearly upset by my feedback. And, you know, I said, listen, I, my, 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 my goal here is to encourage, not to discourage. If I thought your game, if there right. was nothing there, I wouldn't have taken the time the, the, totally. day, the day before I'm launching a, my first Kickstarter, you know, uh, to, to, to tell you what I thought. I sat down, I played your game, I, I saw something in it, but it wasn't realized yet. And, you know, it's like, yep. if you don't have the the desire to, you know, like, and, and then the response was like, well, it's, it's the thing that you hate about it is what makes it unique. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't hate anything. Okay. Like I, I have zero investment in your game, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So, and I don't begrudge this person. And we ended up having a really positive conversation at the, at the end, but, but I had to, I had to kind of, I had to make the sort of emotional yeah. compromise so we could get to that point. Yeah. A lot of people's egos are tied up into their design. So I get it. It's, I mean, listen, I've, I've made, I've worked on 30 games. I personally designed 12 games. I had two games come out this last year. I, I've got nothing that's like anyone's doing backflips over. I mean, I'm buddies with people like Eric Lang who are like, the, he could crap in a box and it would make like $5 million. And like, and I think Eric is a crazy talented person. I'm not saying that he's not talented. Um, but I'm surrounded by is that a legacy crap or is that just a standard like area control crap? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it just it would be in the shape of a cool monster. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, I'm pretty cool. sure he actually right, does good. crap cool monsters. But but you know I've never had a hit, and and honestly like and, and the thing is is I, I'm in you know Nate you consider yourself to be more on the business side of things. Like I work more on the business side of things, but I most certainly like am am a, a creative. Uh, like the creative side of things is what really I love. And I'm not saying that, that you don't, but I, I have this kind of conundrum where like, I want, like I have no game coming out in 2018 and it's, and it's the first year in five years I don't have a game coming out. And, and like, there's some part of me that's like, oh, I got a company, I got all these things. I, you know, we, we've got all these things going on. I'm working on all these cool games. I got to work with rock stars like John Clavis. Like I'm working with Martin Wallace. That's, that's more important, but there's some little part of me that's like, Oh, have a game coming out in 2018 this sucks uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i get that totally get that um jesse is there any last words from you my friend well, i don't think so i think uh i mean just thinking about what we've done i think this new segment thing's really fun um i'm looking forward to coming up with more games and torturing our hosts for entertainment yeah uh the guests we're we're the hosts we don't oh, right. we don't oh, get tortured no. we torture yeah. them Right, right, right. Okay, cool. So on that note, we're going to sign off. We're running a little bit over, but we were late to start. And then there's, you know, lag problems. So we are going to sign off right now. So good night to everybody in out Maple Syrup Land. We'll be back next week. We're going to try out a few more segments uh, before we start booking people on the regular. Uh, Erica, by the way, couldn't be here tonight. Um, she's just started back up at work. She's a teacher. And so she's just getting the, you know, the post-holiday uh blues or something right anyway so we'll see you guys all next week thank you very much to nate and travis for uh, you, playing Lawrence. our games with us and we will i'm sure hear. i'm sure we're gonna hear tons more from brent circuses and from colossal games yep. this year uh if you are on kickstarter if you want to support a really cool game uh go look up what's the name of the game travis western legends 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 you got to give the <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to making little theme sound effects for all of our segments. I don't know how we're going to awesome. do it, but let's do I it. love it. All let's right. See. So, on that note, good night to Meeple Syrup people out there. We'll talk to you guys next week. Keep on making great games. <laughs>